And thank you to all of you for coming, and thank you to the INCF for the honor of uh, inviting me and uh, as I gather the first of the INCF seminar series. So that's where I work. Uh, unfortunately, you can't see it from this place anymore because there's a new building right there, uh, which is a very nice building, and I'm not, now my office is there. Um, so I'm actually, this title is, is a little misleading because I'm not going to give you the answer. I'm only going to tell you uh, where we are on what promises to be a very interesting road to understand how one can uh, get there. And let me just, let me start out then by explaining where, where the eventual goal is and where we are right now. So the idea is this, supposing I wanted to construct uh, a, a, a sort of self-sufficient model of a dendrite. So you can imagine my snipping off the dendrite from the rest of the cell. So this is uh, ugly cartoon is that of a cell, and I'm snipping it off and I'm putting it in a, some kind of artificial growth medium. So this is uh, not just a question of what you need to uh, put into it in terms of keeping it alive, but it is primarily a question of what you need to put into the dendrite. What, what are the processes that you need to understand in the dendrite that, uh, that will allow it to take up molecules and inputs and maintain its current form and function. And there are very, very many functions and many intricacies of the form. So the question isn't simply what do you need to pump in. Really the question is how do the things that you put in there, how do the molecules and signals that go into the dendrite work together to give all the functions of the dendrite and furthermore create a system which sustains itself over a lifetime and performs the very, very many computations that a dendrite must do. So what do you need for this? So you need, of course, the synaptic input and the various growth factors that impinge on it. That's what I've drawn this watering can to represent. You need to understand the principles, the chemistry, electricity, mechanical, and other principles that uh, keep it going. You need to know what parts are in there, molecules, channels, and so on. And you need to, of course, provide the nutrients, so to speak, the proteins and uh, other components which make up the dendrite. In terms of modeling such a thing, what do you need to know? You need to know, of course, data, lots of data, on the inputs, on the components that make it up, on the interactions, on what's happening there in the soma and nucleus. And, of course, you need to instantiate, you need to represent all of the principles, the biophysical and chemical principles, in terms of simulation tools. They have to represent the laws of physics. So this sort of sets out a uh, sort of very long-term, to me, a, a very interesting grand challenge to build up to, where we understand enough about what's going on in the dendrite that you can simply supply the molecules at one end and then the rest should happen through the rules that have been built into the system. Okay, so that's where we want to go, and let me tell you how we're proceeding along that way, and a very long and interesting road still ahead. So what I'll do is I'll discuss the building blocks in terms of the component mo models that uh, we're building up and some of the tools. Then I'll very briefly go over uh, some of the operations that this structure, this virtual dendrite, must carry out in order to perform its tasks. First, of course, the standard operations of computations that it does internally, which are what the dendrite is out there for, its, uh, its signal processing roles, its roles in memory. I will skip over some very in entertaining stuff to do with homeostasis for lack of time, and I'll spend a bit of time discussing self-assembly, which I think is, of course, crucial to this whole thing. And then I, I'll try and integrate all of this and give you a sketch of how I think, how I imagine, we might be able to work towards a, a really, I wouldn't say complete, but an interesting starting point for a model for a virtual dendrite, which has all the nice attributes that I mentioned. Okay, so let's start with models, and of course models can be of different kinds. They're word models, they're mathematical models, and then there are the detailed models where you like to put in a lot of the bi biological uh, attributes that you know are in the system. And of course this is where we would like to go, but let me just uh, give you some glimpses of how we build up to that level. So now word models are of course the staple of biology. Here's a very famous word model by Don Donald Hebb. 
um, to do with plasticity, and all of you know this, so I'm not going to read it out again. Uh, that's the short version of this. So here is a model which makes some very interesting and testable predictions, but does not put it in mathematical form. So it is a qualitative model, and in biology, most models are actually of this kind. For example, the theory of evolution was posed in this form. That is sort of the baseline model for all of biology. But, of course, we like to go a little bit more precise. So then there are mathematical models. So here is one form of a model for a neuron, which is nice in being uh, something that can be analytically worked upon. So here's a, a simple summation uh, device which takes weighted inputs. It transforms the, the summed value through an output. And then that can go to further stages of a network. And this is a mathematical way of representing what a, what a network does. And you can have various learning rules. I think these are from, from Gerstner, um, which tell you how the weights that you saw in the previous case, how these should be adjusted according to previous activity of the network. So this is a mathematical level. What a biolog biologist likes is something like this. I'm not saying this is the full model by any means. This is a small glimpse of a model. <laughs> but biologists like things like this with lots of uh, colorful boxes and interesting letters of the alphabet co connected by arrows. And of course, these are extremely deceptive because there's a lot more going on. Once you, once you st step into the realm of talking about biological detail, you know, there's, there's sort of no end to it. But anyway, this is the sort of thing that is at least the starting point for detailed models. Now, even if you have a detailed model, you still have many levels at which you could describe, de describe what's going on. So you could start out, let's start at the level of molecules. You might want to discuss stochastic forms in Brownian motion. You might want to discuss what's happening at the level of individual molecules as they go about their business and bump into each other and perhaps react. You could decide, okay, no, I'm not interested in that. I'm more interested in what's happening at a bulk level. And so some kind of chemical equations of the more uh, differential equation kind would be uh, applicable where you treat uh, the molecular, molecular concentration as a continuum rather than as uh, individual molecules. And then you go up through diffusion, Nernst equation, Cable equation, various hodgkin oxley forms, and so on. So actually, it's a, I like this set of equations. It's a, it's a compact set which does an awful lot. It describes a great deal of what happens um, for the purposes of modeling neuro neuroscience. Yeah. And uh, Anyway, so we're somewhere in there is our level of detail that we would like to choose. And it's actually an art to pick an appropriate level of detail which gives you uh, enough information about what's going on but doesn't make it unbearably difficult to do the calculations. Here's another form of uh, looking at the level of details. For example, you might want to represent through mass action kinetics. You might say that this is my favorite level of detail. You might want to discuss how receptors and ligands bind and give rise to transduction. So here's the point version of that. So the ligand binds to the receptor, gives a complex. That binds to the G protein, gives a, a ternary complex. You get your GTP-GDP exchange. And then off you get your molecules to do further things downstream. Now, of course, this is very, very oversimplified, even though you know, we're already starting to put a fair number of equations into this. This is the level at which most people do modeling these days. If you're discussing chemical systems, you have separate compartments for different key parts of the, of the system, the extracellular region, the membrane, and the intracellular region. And then you put the pro reactions appropriately. So this is a fairly common way to do, to do this kind of modeling. So um, however, you could also go way over to the other extreme and now look at each individual molecule as it bounces around in space and then occasionally bumps into uh, something it wants to react with, and you could model all of that in excruciating detail, which is wonderful, except it takes a long time. And of course, you need the parameters in far more detail if you're going to do this kind of calculation. So these are levels of description, even within the framework of uh, chemical kinetics, if you've decided that is what you want to describe. So what do we want to put in the model? Yeah? So supposing you've picked some level of description, what we need to put in? We need to put in a parts list. We need to know what we're going to model, and we need the numbers for those things. So here's, a, as I said, a very partial parts list. Um, this is, in fact, the parts list for uh, my first study, which is the one that Jeanette referred to, which I foolishly and overambitiously decided I wanted to model uh, memory. And what happened was that I would model some small part of it, and then Ravi Anger would say, you know, it would be nice if you also put in this additional pathway. And so this happened for many, many months, and well, sooner or later I ended up with this, this uh, mess. So this is one version of the parts list, and if you now look into 
each of these deceptively simple blobs, you'll discover that actually inside each one of them there's something like that. A, a lot of reactions and more of them as you go along to look at more and more details. And when you put it on your computer screen to represent the calculations, it looks like that. And this again is now very dated. It's, it's much worse now. You know, even, even now, f 13, 14 years ago, there were more than 100 known essential players in synaptic plasticity. And this is from a very nice review by uh, Josh Shanes, Shanes and Lichtman from uh, 99. So unfortunately, things have gotten considerably worse. Um, at last count, there were over 1,400 components identified. This is Seth Grant's work uh, in the postsynaptic density alone. And so now, what do you do? You know, you have these these alarmingly uh, large numbers of interactions to deal with. Anyway, we'll we'll discuss uh, how we how we manage manage to deal with this. But these are just the parts. So now every part, every molecule in there has multiple phosphorylation states. And if it's a complicated molecule like CAM kinase 2, it may have millions of potential permutations and combinations of phosphorylation states. So that's not much fun. Each state will have multiple reactions. Each state also you need to now specify concentrations. And if you're doing it in 3D, you need to specify where it is. And then you need to give parameters for the actual reactions. So I'm just trying to s tell you this is uh, not a trivial process, and it relies on the work of hundreds of thousands of scientists doing experiments, as well as lots of people doing modeling work to be able to c construct stuff like this. How do you set up the parameters? Again, here's a, you know, the, the ultra brief version of that. You s identify the key pathways. So here's a, a set of key pathways that is involved in control of protein synthesis at the dendrite. You take any one of these pathways and you break it down into the, those little reactions that you saw. And so there could be five, 10, even many, many more reactions. You fit the data, which sounds easy, but it's actually one of the nastiest, as all of you know. And now you have to do this for all the pathways. Now, even if you have this pathway beautifully parameterized, that's still not enough, because now you have to make it talk to its neighbor pathway. And you now need to do this for all of them one by one and get the whole thing to work properly. And then you validate it by comparing it with data. So this is an ultra brief overview of, of the process, which takes a long time to do. So for example, here are some curves that my student Pragati Jain has uh, built up uh, in a study on, as I said, on uh, protein synthesis. This is CAM kinase 3, not CAM kinase 2. CAM kinase 2 is much worse. OK, so you parameterize it. And now you, you've got to the point of being able to uh, say that you have a way of doing all of this for some w few sets of pathways. And so at this point, you know, we've been doing this incrementally over the years, and many people have been doing this over the years. So there are some dozens of reasonably well-parameterized pathways. We think these are the most important ones, of course. That's why we do these first. This is a case of you know, the, the drunk who looks under the lamppost to find his keys. Uh, not because you drop them there, but because that's where the light is. Yeah? So unfortunately, that's the situation we are in. We look at pathways which are well studied, not necessarily because they are the only essential ones, but because those are the only ones where enough is known to do the modeling. So this is a start. So this is where we're starting. And this is sort of the, the initial steps in working towards this uh, virtual dendrite. OK, so that was the models. So now let me tell you a little bit about the tools that we use. And as you can see from this cartoon uh, and this picture, uh, the, our favorite tool is the Moose. And Moose is the name of our simulator, which is not really a simulator per se. It's actually an environment in which you can do simulations using whichever numerical methods happen to suit your problem. So this is Aditya Gilra, um, who's one of the people in it. And that's a stuffed moose, alas, um, but a very pretty one anyway. OK, so I should stress that moose is just one of the many tools in the ecosystem of modeling uh, tools and databases that is essential for this kind of an effort. So moose talks to various databases. It talks to various standards. It talks through MPI and music to other simulators, potentially. It talks to Python and perhaps other languages, depending on your requirements. And really, a lot of this 
infrastructure, this ecosystem, is made possible by the efforts of the INCF, and which is one of the key goals of the INCF to make all of this possible. So, um, so Moose, what does it do? One kind of thing it does is standard compartmental calculations, uh, differential equations that describe the electrical properties of a neuron. Um, standard cable equation, uh, channel formalisms and all of that. Mike Hines has written about this years and years ago. Moose also does the chemical calculations, and it does these not just individual point or compartmental wise, it also does it in terms of reaction diffusion calculations. Um, and you can, anyway, you just string together the compartments, you do spatial discretization, and you get that to work. Um, there's a meeting starting tomorrow where we actually discuss a lot of these technical technicalities in a lot more detail. I'll just skim over this. So what Moose is uh, able to do is to model across a very wide range of scales, starting from single molecules using a plug-in through to Smolden, which is a simulator developed by uh, Steve Andrews and Dennis Bray, single particle uh, Monte Carlo calculations, all the way through uh, the kinds of chemical calculations I've been describing, going up to cellular biophysics and even to fairly large networks of tens of thousands of neurons. So these are all things that we uh, are interested in and are doing using Moose. Okay, so that's sort of a very brief overview of the tools that uh, are applied. And as I stress, Moose is only one of the many, many tools in this large ecosystem. Um, and there are other tools which can do similar things and uh, better things. So now let me change gears and discuss some of the things that I feel that our virtual dendrite should be able to do. And uh, this is, of course, a very, very small subset of what it clearly does and what other people have studied. But let me just go and begin on this. So one of the key computations that uh, the dendrite does, and the synapses do, is pattern selectivity. And I'm going to use the example of memory for this, of learning and memory. And these are all curves that have to do with both with pattern selectivity and learning and memory. So let me start with this. This is the classic BCM curve. Yeah, uh, Beanstalk, Cooper, Monroe. And uh, the idea is that at low levels of activity, you could call it low frequency of input, uh, the synapse does not change. In other words, it faithfully transmits whatever it gets, and it doesn't change as a result of this information. At higher levels, it actually depresses. In other words, the synaptic weight gets smaller, and at higher still, it goes up the synaptic weight increases. So this is performing an interesting computation. It is deciding what are the input pr patterns, what kinds of properties should be there in the input signal to convince it that now is the time to change and how it should change. This is a, okay, here's another one. So this is one ex uh, extreme. Here's another extreme. That's sort of average over time. And this is over extremely precise times of the order of milliseconds. And this is, of course, the STDP learning rules, spike timing dependent plasticity rule. And yet here, too, you have a very interesting computational operation where, depending on the pattern of input, the cell decides, the synapse decides whether it is going to be weakened or strengthened. And here are other examples of patterns. This is an LTP uh, uh, pattern given by giving a strong burst of input. And here's an LTD pattern, long-term depression, given by giving a weak uh, stimulus for a long time. So these are all forms of pattern selectivity. So many people have looked at this. And I've, here's just a very, very brief list of it. Uh, at calcium dynamics and signaling, uh, many people have looked at uh, CAM kinase 2 and calmodulin. Um, Jeanette and others have looked at uh, protein kinase A dynamics and how that does pattern selection. And we've looked uh, at MAP kinase signal and so on and so on. And many people have looked at this. Here's one uh, study we did where we looked at, uh, where we started out doing some simulations which predicted that if you give two pulses of, in this case, calcium stimulus, and monitor MAP kinase activity in our model, then there would be a peak at around 10 minutes interval between the pulses. So this predicted that there was some kind of pattern tuning in this network. And we went and did the experiments. This is work done by my student, uh, Sri Ramajay. Um, so he, uh, he found that, yes, indeed, if you measure the synaptic plasticity, there is a peak at around the same interval, at around uh, 10 minutes. And then he actually went so far as to measure the chemical activity, and that, too, has a peak at the 10-minute uh, uh, time period. So this was a nice uh, matching up of experiments and, and uh, models. 
And you can go further. I, I played around with this some more, and I asked what happens if you now introduce stochasticity. And it turns out that a weakly tuned stim, uh, response, if you uh, apply a threshold to this system, which happens through signal, which can happen through uh, switching in the signaling pathway, that can give you much sharper tuning in, in so, something like a stochastic resonance-like effect coming out of the chemical kinetics. So. This is just, you know, this is just to illustrate some of the kinds of computations that we need to start to build into the, this uh, virtual dendrite that I'm building up to. Let me talk now about memory, which is, uh, I think, one of the, obviously, one of the key operations that you need to think about. So I'm in favor, for, for whatever reasons, uh, of the idea of synaptic memory being bistable. And this has got a lot of pros and cons to it, and I won't go into that debate. But let's just consider what it would take to make a chemical system which could store information as a bistable switch. So consider a feedback system involving two molecules A and B, where A activates B and B reciprocally activates A. So it goes around the loop. And if you were to block the transmission of information from A to B, and just looked at B as a, at A activation as a function of B, you would get some kind of curve like that, standard chemistry and vice versa. You would get some kind of curve like that if you looked at how B depends on A. So the key thing for this analysis is to plot these two curves on the same axis, which you can do by sort of taking this and flipping it over the 45 degree line. And then those of you who are familiar with this kind of operation realize that the intersection points here tell you a great deal. So for example, if there's a single intersection point right down there, this intersection point is that point where each of the uh, values will sustain the precisely matching value of the other molecule. And so this is a stable point. So for example, if you were to start over here with B, it would produce that level of A, that level of A, now reading off the red curve, would produce that level of B, and so on and so forth until it ended up there. It would converge to that point. And vice versa, if you have a curve that, if you have the curves intersecting only up there, then that is the only stable point. And it becomes interesting when you have multiple intersection points like this, so that that turns out to be stable, that turns out to be stable, and that is like a threshold. So if you start just above that point, you'll always converge there. If you start below that, you'll always converge there. So why is this interesting for memory? Well, one reason out of many is that, of course, it's got two stable states. But I emphasize the word stable, which means that if there's a perturbation, if, for example, there's some molecular turnover, new molecules are synthesized, old ones are degraded, that is just like a small shift away from the stable point. And the system, by virtue of its uh, kinetics and dynamics, will end up at the original stable point. So this is a mechanism for memory storage which is robust against uh, molecular turnover and other disruptions, which is what you would like for a memory. So this seemed like a you know, fairly exotic idea. And one thing we, uh, I did with Naren Ramakrishnan a few years ago was to ask, are such chemical circuits all this unlikely? And so we just sort of systematically went through uh, an alphabet of possible reaction systems and built up arbitrary, you know, com uh, systematically built up uh, reaction systems of ever increasing size up to six reactions. And we discovered that 10% of everything we tried was bistable. In other words, so this was a big surprise to me. I had thought that bistables were extraordinarily rare and uh, unlikely things to happen. I, you know, almost miraculous that evolution stumbled up upon it. But it turns out that actually they are very common in chemical space if you just arbitrarily connect up reactions. And it turns out furthermore, this is meant to represent a tree of relatedness of these different bistables. So here's the simplest one we found. And a lot of things are quote unquote descended from it. In other words, they are elaborations of the simple bistable. These are ones which are not elaborations of that, but are their own new roots. And they have, a, again, a whole bunch of descendants. So the key thing is that there are lots of bistables, and they're all interconnected with each other in various interesting ways. So it is actually quite easy in principle to make chemical systems that store information. So here are some of them. So for example, CAM kinase 2 has long been proposed as a molecule uh, that stores information at the synapse. Um, interestingly, John Lisman, who's proposed this for all these years, is now stepping back and saying, actually, perhaps it is not the memory molecule, but it is clearly involved in setting up the memories. And we'll revisit that right towards the end of the, of the talk. <laughs> 
Here's another form of bistability, which um, I've been very interested in over the years. This looks at uh, a feedback loop involving protein kinase C, MAP kinase cascade, and phospholipase A2. And this can be triggered either through calcium or through a stimulus like a, a PDGF, platelet-derived growth factor, or any other growth factor. And if you remember the analysis we had of the intersecting dose-response curves, this is the same kind of analysis for these pathways, and there are indeed uh, three intersection points and two stable points among them. And you can analyze what happens in time and so on. So this is something which I'm particularly fond of, not just because it was my first foray into the field, but also because uh, subsequently um, we and others were able to show that this actually works. So uh, Prahlad Ram in, in Ravi Iyengar's lab worked with, worked with me to uh, do this analysis. And the key thing in trying to analyze a pathway like this is to say what happens to the response if you, don't, if you leave the actual direct pathway alone, in other words, your direct stimulus is left unchanged, but you block part of the feedback. Right? If you are able then to abrogate, if you are able then to eliminate the storage of information, then this system might be an interesting way, that might be a signature, so to speak, of the ability of the system to store information. And so you can block phospholipase A2 or you can block protein kinase C, which are not, as I've said, in the direct pathway. And that's what you see. So the solid black lines are the simulation curves. So that's what happens if you block it. That's what happens if you don't. And the uh, colored line in green is w w the experimental data, three data points, uh, for what happens if you leave the pathway alone. And that's what happens if you block it. And this is blocking it with the other thing. And this is all gels and things to analyze it with. So the key prediction of this is that even if you block things which are not in the direct line, you will greatly truncate, you will reduce the duration of the response, which is something that was confirmed experimentally. And even more recently, um, George Augustine and uh, Hide Tanaka in, uh, in his lab at Duke uh, were able to do a similar kind of analysis uh, through the, uh, in this case, looking at Purkinje neurons and LTD, which they had predicted, which actually Kuroda et al. had predicted uh, used a similar kind of feedback loop. And they showed that, yes, indeed, if you block the uh, phospholipase A2 pathway, you are able to uh, eliminate the long-term depression. So that's, that was very, very gratifying that someone else was able to show this in a neur neuronal context. OK, so there's a lot of interesting stuff to discuss on the homeostasis front. And I'm going to skip over it entirely. Um, because I, I thought we, I'm, I would like to talk a bit about the self-assembly part instead. But this is where we do a lot of calculations which involve both electrical and, uh, and uh, uh, chemical uh, simultaneously. So let me talk now about self-assembly. And this is so, so sort of coming to the crux of what I think is key for making a virtual dendrite. How do you build a system where if you feed it molecules, it will assemble more, it will sustain itself, it will preserve the unique subdivisions of the compartments of the spines and the dendrite and so on, and sustain these for long periods of time. So let me scale this problem down a great deal. Yeah? Supposing you have two coupled compartments, how can these set up different molecular identities? How can it be that compartment A is going to have one set of molecules and compartment B has another set of molecules? Yeah? So, for example, how could a piece of den how could just a piece of uh, dendrite uh, decide suddenly that it wanted to become a spine? Yeah. So the general analysis I'll dis I'll discuss with you actually does uh, quite a bit more. It works. Th it it can handle different forms of coupling through transport, or snares, or synthesis or turnover, or even simply diffusion. And I actually came across this effect through uh, a very large simulation I was doing which gave me an, a result which I did not understand at all, which is I had been modeling uh, the uh, responses of CAM kinase 2 in one of these big uh, multi-scale models with electricity and all of that. And it did something very peculiar, which took me a long while to figure out. I mean, so the simulation was running, and it was, you know, you know, this is one of those situations where, in principle, you know everything that's going on. I had built the simulation. I had all the parameters at my fingertips. I knew, I, and I thought I knew what I'd put into this, and I knew what I expected it to do. What it actually did was this. I would give it a pulse of stimulus, 
which did the right thing for map kinase. Fine, it turned it on. It seemed to do the right thing for the uh, bulk number of uh, cam kinase 2 in the, in the bulk of the, of the uh, dendritic spine. But if I looked at the postsynaptic density, it oscillated. And this just did not make sense. I mean, leaving aside the, the fact that this is experimentally extremely implausible, I just could not figure out how I got oscillations out of the system. And it was actually several years later and fiddling around with a lot of analysis that um, I'm going to tell you about that I finally realized what, what the reason was. And this is the analysis framework. So if you consider a system where you have two compartments, A and B, and these compartments are coupled through some kind of trafficking process, which could be as simple as diffusion, or it could be some very, very directed snare-mediated or other process. And if you permit these compartments to have pretty much any reactions in them, with the only stipulation being that there's a some species of molecule M, which is converted to M star, and then that is trans transferred to the other compartment, and M is also transferred to the other compartment, right? So you have, in principle, a possibility of a trafficking cycle with various reactions going on along the way. And so here are the assumptions. The traffic rates depend only on the uh, levels of M and M star, yeah? And whatever trafficking processes take it, uh, take it uh, through, these, through the uh, compartments. The signaling events that take place are faster than the trafficking events. And finally, something that everyone should agree with, that there should be flux balance at steady state. In other words, the total amount of M going in is equal to the total amount coming out at steady state, which is almost by definition going to be the case. So you put this together, and it turns out that then one critical curve accounts for a lot of what you see in the literature. And that is the value of M as a function of the total concentration of M in all forms in this compartment. So let me just rephrase that. So let's say M total is the total amount of molecule M in all possible chemical forms present in compartment A. That's M total. And M is just the amount of M in this particular state. So now, if you go through the literature and analyze how this uh, function looks, it turns out that there are only three forms. Well, to a very good approximation, there are only three forms. One is something that looks a little bit like a breaking wave. And this is an unusual form. This happens only when this reaction, S1, is a bistable reaction, when it's a bistable system. So this breaking wave system is one possible dependence of M and on M tot. Another one is a negative slope one, where it goes up for, for a while, and then as M tot, as the total amount of M increases beyond a point, it starts to decline. This is actually quite common. This happens, for example, if there's uh, double phosphorylation. This happens if there's various kinds of feedback. There are many ways in which you can get this kind of a curve. And that's what the literature analysis showed. A, a good fraction, I think 30 or 40% of all cases I looked at had this kind of a dependence. And the rest of them were a simple monotonic increase. So that means that the more of M you put in, the more of this molecule you put in there, the more is present in that form. Okay, so now the analysis, which I will just tell you about and not go over the mathematical gory details is that if you now include the flux balance requirement, saying that the amount going in must balance the amount going out at steady state, then you end up with a null line, which is another constraining curve. And this is a typical null line, the heavy black line. And if this null line intersects the uh, curve that you got for m versus m tot, which it does here and here and here, that is a fixed point of the system. And it turns out that that is stable, that is stable, and that is an unstable fixed point. And you can calculate these for very many uh, possible combinations of trafficking and curves. Okay, so this equation hides a lot, but it's very, very simple to derive from the flux balance requirements for the system. And as I said, these are the three possible uh, shapes that I found by exploring the literature. The outcome of this, in a nutshell, is the following. That if you add signaling to trafficking in the manner I described, you can end up with compartments which take up different molecular identities. So the same system can have different stable states with different uh, sets of molecules in each compartment. 
it can end up with switching of states as a process of organelle mat maturation. That is, as you add one molecule, at some point there'll be flipping over of states and the uh, compartment will take on a new identity. You can end up with sustained receptor insertion, which is something that happens actually in synaptic plasticity. And this is the case that started me off on this wild goose chase. This is the case of oscillation. You can end up with systems where the molecule the concentrations actually go up and down. And you know, I'll be very happy to sit with you and work through the math of all of this. So here's an example of what you get for diffusively coupled compartments. So there's the simple case where if you have very boring reactions for uh, this reaction system S, you will just end up with one stable state. With many kinds of cases, you will end up with uh, a bistable system. In other words, your molecules can uh, either pr preferentially be phosphorylated here, if it's a phosphorylation thing, or there. And that state will sort of self-organize and become distinct. You can have tristable systems, quite a few of them. And then there's this really ugly case, which is actually quite contrived. It's in a very narrow parameter range. You can get a four-way stable system, a quad stable system. So that, I think, is implausible. But it's interesting uh, to see that this can happen, mathematically speaking. OK. Another thing that you get from something like this is, is symmetry breaking. And this is starting to inch towards what might be an interesting possibility for the virtual dendrite, which is that as you uh, add molecules into the system, which I'm doing uh, in a very, very slow time course uh, in, this, in these calculations, as you add molecules to the system, it will suddenly reach a point where the system can now exist in one of two states. And so let's say the parent dendrite will uh, decide to pick one set of uh, one state, one set of molecules there. And then another subset of the system will pick an, the opposite state. It's, a, it's, a, it's one or the other. And that's what's happening here. This is stochastic calculation. I've slowly been adding molecules. And you'll see that initially, this was the one building up, the, the marker molecule. And then at this point, stochastically, things flipped around. And then this one took over. And now there's no chance of it ever flipping back. Yeah, it's the, as, you, as you continue to add new molecules to the system, this is going to remain the one marked with the marker molecule. So this is an example. This is, this is very preliminary uh, data, I'm afraid. But anyway, this is an example of how this kind of uh, trafficking and internal reactions can cause uh, subsets of a system to adopt different uh, molecular configurations, which is, of course, a prerequisite for forming different kinds of compartments. So uh, what, what was the difference between compartment A and B? Then? They were identical to start with. Okay. That's, that's the key thing. So they were completely identical. So they could have been anywhere along, say, a patch of dendrite. Mm. And you just flow in more molecules. And at some point, the system stochastically picks one or the other. So this, I'm, I'm asserting, is one possible basis, this kind of trafficking thing, which is, of course, like all such mathematical analyses, it's grossly oversimplified. This could be the basis for something that we are well familiar with in the case of dendrites, which is that you start out with some configuration of the dendrite, and following activity, uh, you produce new uh, protrusions, uh, new dendritic spines. And that, I think, is uh, a key uh, step in the self-assembly that I would like to be able to understand. So I've actually recently been modeling uh, one variant of this, which is the process of insertion of amper receptor through stargazing. So this is a, a mechanism that has now got quite a lot of experimental evidence, where the molecule stargazing uh, anchors an amper receptor. And this is uh, the stargazing, that is. Uh, is attached to PSD95, a, a key postsynaptic density protein, uh, depending on its level of phosphorylation. So this is an extremely simple thing, right? At face value, all you have is uh, stargazing and the receptor. And then it gets uh, stuck to it more tightly if there's more phosphorylation, uh, uh, more sites ph phosphorylated on the stargazing. So it turns out that if you run through this analysis, and you can see it's actually a very, very simple uh, reaction system. Um, all you have is the three phosphorylation states, zero phosphorylation, one phosphorylation, two. You have the CAM kinase 2 and the calcineurin. And you have the, uh, the supply of the receptors, which is uh, in the unphosphorylated state over there. And this very, very simple system, uh, if you run through this analysis, 
uh, has this beautiful negative slope uh, property that you saw earlier. There's the null Klein going down. And it turns out that you can give this LTP or LTD-like stimuli, stimuli. This is a stochastic calculation. And it can flip on, and it will stay there, and it can flip off, and it will stay there. Okay, so this is a, a system which, by virtue of the self-assembly process, is also capable of storing information. And there's another way which we had analyzed. Again, this was a, a result which I got before I, before I understood the mathematical principles underneath it. Um, whereby another uh, form of trafficking of amp receptor can also cause uh, state switches to the on state or the off state, where the on state is defined by having a lot of receptors in the synapse, which will uh, keep it there. Okay, so at this point, um, I will start to pull these threads together and give you a glimpse of how I think one can uh, work towards analyzing and building up a virtual dendrite. So this is, these, this is what I think ought to be there. First of all, you need to have a bunch of processes that describe what happened at the spine and synapse. And I've color coded this to indicate where I am, where my group is. And of course, many other people have been working on this. So there are good models for some things which I have not done uh, myself. But uh, so blue means very little uh, modeling has been done. I think, in fact, for transmission, very little modeling has been done because it's been hitherto a very inaccessible system. Green means it's thoroughly studied. There's lots of models out there. And yellow uh, means that it's somewhere in between, that there's, it's an interesting point for modeling. There's a lot of stuff going on, and we would like to see some more. So what do you need at the, sp at the spine and synapse? You need to have a decent model of transmission. Associativity and memory storage, there's loads of models out there. There's loads of components that you could start to plug into your virtual dendrite. Molecular traffic is getting there, but I think there's a lot more to be done there. Pattern selectivity, again, you've seen, has been studied in, in great detail. S restructuring of the spine, I think, is an absolutely critical and interesting and relatively unexplored uh, uh, topic. I think that's uh, absolutely going to be very interesting to follow up. Going on to the dendrite, the dendrite is the site of a huge amount of very interesting balance of, ch of channels in or which sustain its electrical properties even though the spines are becoming active or inactive, even though the cell is undergoing different kinds of met meta metabolic uh, conditions and so on. So this is something which is fascinating. Gina Torrigiano and uh, Eve Marder and others have been working on this for a long while. And I think there's a huge amount still to be done to unravel the molecular details underneath the, these processes. Spine formation and growth, again, I think this is, this is going to be key. This is obviously key to, the, to, the, to this enterprise. The signaling in the, sina in the dendrite, of course, a lot still has to be worked out there. Uh, protein synthesis and turnover, this is something that we have been modeling, and I think we've got a decent model of uh, now. And then the molecular transport, I think there's a lot to find out exactly about how molecules and which molecules end up uh, in the right place. And then there's the support processes, what happens at the cell body and nucleus. So again, transport and housekeeping, relatively understudied. Transcription control and protein synthesis, these are things which uh, Pragati in my lab is currently doing a model on, and actually has a model on. We now need to do the, we're in the validation stages for this. And once that's going, then that actually is, a, I think, an important step along there. Molecular sorting, how does the cell decide which molecules go where? What decides whether this is the axon and that is the dendrite? So I think a lovely set of questions there. And then, of course, there's the electrophysiology, action potentials, and so on, which is very well studied. And then, of course, you need to go to the network. You need to find out what, what convergence of activity come to this particular cell, this particular dendrite. That's essential to know from, the, from that. And then likewise, partly because of this activity, but because of information from other parts of the brain, you need to know what are the growth factors and other broadcast neurotransmitters that impinge on this dendrite. And in order to do this in a reasonable amount of time, you need some kind of abstracted learning rules for the whole system, because you're not going to model every single spine at the level of detail that we would love to achieve. OK, so that is the sort of grand scheme that I have in mind, and which I'm keen to have many people uh, come along on board with, because it's a huge project. We need to know the network context and inputs. We need to know what's going on at the spines and dendrites. 
We need to develop the, the simulation tools that embody all the laws. And we need to have some idea, of course, of what's going on at the cell body to make this work. And the key thing is to get a picture of, you know, how is it that you can just feed molecules to the system in principle? Feed things to the system, and then the molecules take it from there. They are going to decide, they're going to use their own logic to assemble new spines depending on input, to store information, to manage the channel densities, to, do, to make structures and maintain those structures for a lifetime. That, I think, is where we would like to go with all of this. So, to wrap up then, an overview, we looked at the building blocks that we've been assembling over the years, the models and the tools. We look at some of the computations that the dendrite must do, some of which are essential for its role as a computational entity in a cell, and some of which are essential for its role as a system which maintains its own identity and expands and extends that identity in response to stimuli. And then I ended up with a sketch of where I think all of this uh, is going and where uh, we'd love to have people provide it. So what we need, we need more data, we need more models, we need models where we put all of it together, multi-scale models, we need tools to make this possible and collaborations with you and with everybody on the, in the world to get all of these things together. So I'll wrap up there, I'll thank the, uh, my collaborators, my students, CG, Harsha, Arnold, who's now in uh, Stryer's lab, Pragati, um, Subha, Neeraj, and Aditya, and sources of funding and support, and all of you for your attention. assemble a dendrite, you have most of the cells in the nervous system probably don't have spines. Mm -hmm. You have them on the the pyramidal, yes. the spiny, all these that have probably a lot of plasticity. Yes. But wouldn't it be rather simple to start with uh, the others that don't have a non spiny complication of spines? <laughs> Or, or that's not a challenge, is it? Oh, no, no. It's a, I, think, I think it's actually harder. Um, okay. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I need to work through that. I and mean, the nice thing about a spine is that it is a relatively, relatively isolated by uh, diffusion-wise compartment. Um, I'll just say that, you know, uh, it's actually very tricky uh, in when you're considering the, the different differences in concentrations between even the spine, even the spiny synapse and the other ones, and the, and the dendrite. It's actually very tricky because you now need to, if you're doing a, a composite model, you need to account for not only the presence of concentration gradients, you need to maintain those concentration gradients. And I think this will become much harder if now you, you have a, a cylinder and now you have to maintain much steeper concentration gradients over just the postsynaptic density. So I actually think it'd be, it's, I, it's a great challenge, <laughs> but it's hard. <laughs> Is it okay uh, to say that spines are specialized parts for plasticity? I, I think that they may be specialized for that, but I don't think that's the only way to do it by any means. Yeah. But yeah. Um, so yes, I would like to someday have multiple kinds of virtual dendrites, including the non-spiny ones. I'm starting, you know, this is again a, perhaps a case of looking under the lamppost. Yeah, there's a lot of data on the spine, and so maybe that's where we, we begin. <laughs> so, uh, in the beginning of your lecture, you, you discussed this levels of description, and then towards the end, you have the part list for the virtual dendrites. So, uh, could you comment on what levels of description will be most important to sort of work on these parts? Right, that's, that's yeah, that's uh, a, a you know, really important question. I think that almost certainly you will need to do uh, Monte Carlo, perhaps single particle diffusion level description of stuff happening in the spine. It's just a matter of numbers. If you take resting calcium concentration or resting concentration of pretty much any of the molecules. The numbers of molecules are in the low tens or even under 10 for calcium to uh, a few hundred for maybe say receptors or things that are there in high concentrations. So the numbers are small, the dimensions are, ex are the, the you know, 
the geometry is extremely tortuous. Um, and you will also want to, for example, consider the structure remodeling, which I think is best done in a uh, Monte Carlo context. So I think this is, so that is what I think we'll have to do here. You may have to, you know, restrict yourself to doing that purely on technical grounds. You may have to do that only for one or a small number of spines, simply because you'd lack the computational power to do that. So you have to do some kind of abstraction for the rest of the spines in the cell. For the dendrite, again, it's, it's a matter of constrained by computational power. You're probably going to have to do reaction diffusion. Uh, perhaps Gillespie method stochastic calculations for some of it, but I suspect that will be very expensive for most of it. And for the cell, cell is uh, a big volume. I don't think you need to uh, worry too much about that. Very fantastic to, to see that you model the, the spine size. Uh, but my question is, as far as I know, what argument is the spine size is critically depends on interaction be between CAM modeling and the actins? Mm -hmm. But I haven't seen you include the actins in that. So you're, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. So I, I sort of fake it. I'm, I've been modeling the translocation of calcium, of calmodulin. And, and cam kinase and all of that. And I've just been saying, okay, here's a reaction that happens when the conditions are right. I've not put in the mechanisms. So, you know, this, this is, these are all levels of detail which one would like to put in. One needs the parameters, one needs uh, tools which can deal with the actual, you know, mechanics and motors of, of things moving. Um, but at this point, we're just faking it. Yeah, sorry, yeah. last question, because I'm, I'm kind of scared of uh, like mod modeling this uh, chemical this process. One question is, I always have a, have a problem about how to estimate the parameter by fitting the data. Because in real experiment, when they do this experiment, actually they perturb the whole, whole network. So the parameters that you obtain from the current, like a experiment mostly kind of biased. So when you model that, and you cover a building model based on some biased experiment da data, how, how, you, how you consider this? Yeah, no, no, I mean, this is, this is a problem that all modelers face. So, you know, one just has to go through a process which is systematic to try and make the best of, what you, of the data that you have. Clearly, you like to get data from multiple sources, preferably different kinds of experiments, which are relevant to that parameter. Another thing that one routinely does is a parameter a sensitivity analysis to ask, does this parameter actually matter? Will it change the outcome if this parameter is twice as big or 10 times as big or small as, as, as you estimated? It turns out that for a very large fraction of the parameters, you can change them by a factor of two without anything happening. Some of them are more sensitive. You can change them by a factor of maybe 50% or 20% and then bad things will happen. But usually those parameters are precisely the ones which are the key regulator, regulators of the system. So in general though, um, I don't know if evolution has been kind to us, but I think, I think it makes sense, right? Your cells, your, these systems have to function under a very wide range of metabolic conditions. And so one would hope, at least one would like to argue, that the reaction systems are therefore robust to parameters being off for metabolic reasons, but that's helpful to us as modelers because we know our parameters are bad, but hopefully they're still within the range where the cell behaves. Now, now these are all hand-waving arguments, and of course the only res resolution to it is more data, which is why we need collaborations. Yeah. Well, if I uh, a parameter, do you have an absolute zero for that? I mean, are you doubling the temperature in centigrade or in kelvins? Oh, okay. No, no, no. I'm just doubling the rate constant. <laughs> How would you define what is doubling the parameter? Well, it's very, for rate constants, I just say, you know, Kf was one and now it's two. Yeah, but for, it's just the rate constant that may look like other things. Concentration, what is the absolute zero? 
Well, so, temp so temperature is something quite special, and we know that, at least in mammals, the temperature range is narrow. But the parameters that I'm thinking of are concentration and the rates, such as Kf and Kb for a, a exchange or conversion reaction, and Km for an enzyme-catalyzed reaction. So these are parameters which are typically insensitive in this factor of two range. Yeah? Temperature is not. I mean, if you double temperature, well, A, you would die. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, there's, it's, a whole, it's a whole other thing, but it's actually quite remarkable how some species are able to carry out their biochemistry over a temperature range of, of you know, tens of degrees or more. Um, unlike us, um, and still be able to function properly. And that's through some very interesting compensation mechanisms. I'm not dealing with that. Yeah, I guess everyone is sort of satisfied. I, I was just curious myself. Mm -hmm. uh, you ha you um, uh, built some of this reasoning on, on, on uh, these graphs where, where you see where stable and unstable points are and whether the system can switch. Uh, and that is uh, with uh, sort of a deterministic, these nice curves. So mm. with it, uh, I know you have sort of looked at this. How uh, Can you comment upon what happens if you take stochasticity? Well, um, so yeah, yeah. So stochasticity tends to mess things up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so as you saw in uh, one of my slides, I actually had done this switching calculations. Well, here's an example. Here's, here's this kind of analysis, and here's the stochastic calculation. So in some cases, it works just fine. In some cases, it doesn't. Some, so this is, again, a, a matter of sensitivity. So some reaction systems don't care very much if your, if your molecules are, uh, are fluctuating, if your chemistry is fluctuating, as it in fact is, and some, some do. Um, the, uh, I should say that although I had done this analysis through mathematics initially, I then implemented all of these calculations as actual reaction systems to, to convince myself that the analysis was working. And so now, once they, as reaction systems, I can do stochastic calculations on them. And that's something I want to do. Yeah. Okay, thanks again. Thank you.